Hill is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. sang that song last night and a guy came up and asked for my autograph. I wrote that song about 1985, four or five. We recorded it around 1986 on an album we called Contrast. That was a long time ago and I got old. Oh well. We are in John 14.1. <clears throat> the title of tonight's message is Don't Trouble Yourself. Starting in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I was preaching in a CME church years and years ago, Mount Zion I CME church. And uh, after I got done preaching in this church where I wasn't the pastor, I was just a guest preacher, but the pastor called on a lady to pray at the end of the service and she was an old lady and there's a lot of old thinking, you know, and she's praying this prayer and, and then at the end of her prayer she said, and Lord, please grant me a little shanty out back in your kingdom. And I went up to her after I said, ma'am, there's no shanties in heaven. There's no out back in heaven. There's no segregation in heaven. Why don't you step up here with us and get your mansion? The word mansion there means dwelling place. It's a some kind of, a, the way I imagine this, it's some kind of huge apartment complex. And God has made a place for each one of us. And ours are all individual because he knows me and he knows exactly what I'd like on the walls and everything. But my place won't be any better than your place. And your place won't be any better than my place. They're all equal. Of course, the women don't get a place, but no, they don't. That's a joke to get some of you women to smile because you're looking frowny over there. <clears throat> There's a place that he is, right now, Jesus is preparing this place for us. And uh, when, I, when he brings us there, he's going to bring us where he is. It says, as that where I am, there you may be also. A dear pastor friend of mine, and he loves the Lord, I know he does, but his wife passed away some years ago, and he mentioned one time while we are having lunch, he said, boy, he says, I can't wait to get to heaven so I can see my wife again. And I looked at him and I said, Brother George, I said, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be worried about seeing your wife, you're just going to want to see Jesus. I love my wife, but just get out of the way. I want to see Jesus. I don't want to see my wife or an uncle or an aunt or dad or mom. I want to see Jesus like the Greeks said when they came. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Why would you want to see number 2, 3, 4, 10, 50, or 100 when you could be with number 1? And the neat thing about this is Jesus can spend individual time with every single one of us at the same time. I don't know how he does that. Maybe we'll find out. But he is able to do that. My time won't infringe on your time with him, and your time won't infringe on my time. We will have quality bonding time. I'm not going to be worried about seeing anybody else. 
Now, after that, after I see Jesus, whatever he wants is fine. I don't really care. Somebody asked me, I said, well, what do you think you want to do when you're heaven? I said, I don't care. I said, I'll take out the trash. It don't matter to me. Of course, the trash will be perfect trash. So that would be nice. <laughs> but what difference does it make? People are always worried about that, you know. I had a guy actually ask me that when he said, Brother, who do you, you think is going to take out the trash in heaven? I said, first of all, there's probably not any trash in heaven, but who cares? I'll do it. I'll just be glad to be there. What difference does it make? People are worried about the silliest things. I can't wait to see my wife. I can't wait to see my husband. I can't wait to see my child that died when he was young. You're not going to be worried about any of that when you get to heaven. As soon as you get there, you're going to realize, man, I need to see Jesus. That's I need to see. I don't care about Peter, Paul, and Mary and the rest of them. I just want to see Jesus. And I'm going to be there with him. And where I go, he told the boys, uh, you know, and you know the way. Well, here comes a contradiction in the Bible. A contradiction by a man named Thomas. He contradicts Christ. Jesus said, you know the way? And he says, no, we don't. I don't know the way. How can we know the way? We don't know the way. Reminiscent of Peter, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, you know, Elijah or one of the prophets, you know. And, well, who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father, which is in heaven, revealed this to you. Two verses later, Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, boys. I'm going to be crucified. And die and pay the penalty for, our, for your sin, you know. And Peter says, not so, Lord. Well, that's a contradiction. You can't call him Lord and then tell him what he can or can't do. If he's Lord, he can do anything he wants to. I get tickled at people. You know, they think we're going to be bossing Jesus around. <laughs> Jesus said, you know the way. Oh, we don't know the way. Yes, you do, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to this. No man comes to the Father but by me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one name that can save you and that's Jesus. So Muhammad's not going to save anybody. Buddha's not going to save anybody. The myriad of Hindu gods, they're not going to save anybody. Joseph Smith of the Mormons, he's not going to save anybody. Charles Taze Russell's of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he can't save anybody. Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Science, she can't save anybody. The Fillmores of Unity, they can't save anybody. Ellen G. White, early Seventh-day Adventist, she can't save anybody. All these people claim to have the only way to get to heaven. They can't get you there. They can't get you there. Only Jesus. He said it right here. Now, either he's right or he's a liar. You can't have it both ways. He said, there is no other way to get to the Father but by me. So Philip, trying to act studious, says, Lord, show us the Father and that will satisfy us. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you that you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Well, remember earlier in John, he said, the Father and Jesus said, they're one. We're right back to the beginning, as I told you every week, of John chapter 1, verse 1. This whole book, every chapter, declares the divinity of Christ in one way or another, either by works or by words. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He made everything that there was. And in verse 14 says, and then he became flesh. And we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's only one God. And Jesus is the one God. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? You've seen the Father. Nobody ever saw God in his natural state. 
but the personalities of God, the Father, the Word, who became Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now follow this. If you're a Christian tonight, where does Jesus reside? In us, in our heart. Well, if Jesus resides in our heart and the Father resides in Jesus, where does the Father reside? In us also. And Jesus said, I'm leaving and sending you the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit's going to live in your heart. So that's the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians that our body is the temple of God. If you're a Christian. Of course, you still have some struggles to go through. Because you see, we're born with this old crummy sinful nature. And then when we get saved, he gives us a new nature. And so now as a Christian, we got a war going on inside us. Before you were a Christian, you didn't have a war. You just did whatever you wanted to. And you slept like a baby. Now you can't. You got to struggle. There's a war going on. And you have to bring your flesh into subjection and die to self. And that's hard. I don't like it. I don't like it. I never wanted to be a preacher. I didn't want to work at God Tell. I wanted to be a rock and roll star and, you know, keep working in nightclubs like I used to do. I wanted to be a comedian because I used to do that too. I, I, I liked it. I really, my flesh loves the applause of people. That's why I like it when there's more people here. <laughs> Sounds better. My flesh likes it when people come up and say, can I have your autograph? Sir. I like it. I like all of that that goes with it. The glamour. But God showed me that he didn't like it. I'm glad that I still get to sing and I get to crack a few jokes. Of course, sometimes I can make you laugh just with a look. Because I'm so cute. <laughs> I was cuter when I had hair. Doesn't that look better when I do that? Makes me look younger, doesn't it? <laughs> now I have to look at people and say, is my part straight? <laughs> Got some of you to laugh, finally. See, if I'd sold tickets and you had to pay to get in here, you'd be laughing more. You'd be laughing because you had to pay for this. <laughs> Well, the Father does works. Well, if the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit live within the Christian, and if we're obeying God, then who's doing the works? Well, God is. This ministry is a good example of that. God's doing it. Martin and I decided a long time ago we ain't got a clue what we're doing. We just do it. We just do stuff. Whatever happens that day, that's what we do. We don't get too excited. We don't know how to run this ministry. We don't know how to raise money and go out. You know, we're not like the politicians. Go out and raise a billion dollars to spend on a campaign you know you can't win. We have to trust the Lord. And the Lord takes care of all of it. But it's Him doing it, not us. Most people can't see that. They, they think this is a business and we just, we're just good businessmen. Boy, have they got a lot to learn. If this, th if this thing was running by my business principles, we'd have been bankrupt a long time ago. <clears throat> believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else at least believe me for the very work's sake. And in other words, just what about believing what you saw? To these people, see, they saw Jesus raise somebody from the dead. They saw eyes opened up and ears unplugged and leprosy healed and, and people that were lame walking and they saw all this stuff, and yet they wouldn't believe. They saw the 5,000 get fed and the 4,000 get fed, they still wouldn't believe. The Pharisees came along and said, he doesn't do this by the power of God. He does it by the power of the devil, bells above. And that was the chapter where Jesus said, all manner of sin will be forgiven man except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> blasphemy of the Holy Spirit revolves around unbelief until you die and end up in hell. You can't be forgiven for that. It's denying the very power of God. You won't believe what God did and 
because you won't believe what God did, you're not going to ever accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you die in your sin. You die in your unbelief. And by the way, if any of you do die like that, you won't have anybody to blame but yourself. I mean, we've done everything we can do. I've been working at God Tell for 38 years, and for 38 years I've done everything I can do except stand on my head because I get dizzy, so I can't do that. Uh, trying to get people to know Christ. I've approached it from every different angle I can think of. I've tried to tell them stories in songs. I've tried to tell them stories in jokes. I've tried to do everything to bring people to Christ. I've read through the, I've preached through the whole Bible several times, trying to tell people about Jesus. And most of the over a million people that have been through our three missions, they don't ever pay attention. They're going to die and they're going to go to hell. And I have a very, very strong sense that God's going to let me be there and say, I told you so. And then God's going to say what he said. Well, Jesus said that. He said, I told you before things happen, so you'll know that after I told you so. <clears throat> well, they wouldn't even believe what they saw. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works, greater works, well, let's see. When Jesus was here, he was one person walking on the ground, God in Christ, and he did some things. One of the things he did was fed 5,000 people. 5,000 men plus the women and children, and 4,000 men plus the women and children. Maybe 25,000, 30,000 people all together. But you see, since he left and he dwells in the Christians, now there's ministries like ours all over the world. Our ministry alone has fed over a million people. But it's God doing the works and all these other ministries that are of God, not all the ministries you see, because not all of them are, but all of the ones that are of God, God is doing the works and he's doing greater works than he did before because now he's doing it through his people. One of the greatest things that a person could ever do is to lead somebody to Christ. Is to share the gospel message with somebody and that person comes to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and gets into heaven. That's the greatest miracle that anyone can ever do. And now the Lord has people all over the world doing that. But he's the one doing it because he did every one of them. He's there. Greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. These next two verses, some of the TV preachers really love to preach on these verses, but most of them misquote them. They take them out of context. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I'll do it. All right, now we're getting to the stuff. I want stuff. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. <clears throat> Haven't you heard preachers preach that stuff? Mm -hmm. But they forgot to tell you that the same guy that wrote this wrote the explanations of these verses in 1 John. 1 John 5.14 says you can ask God anything and he will answer if it is within his will. So all of a sudden, wait a minute, that's not like I can ask for anything. It's got to be in his will. The second thing he told us was in 1 John 3.22 that we know that God answers our prayers if we keep his commandments. In other words, if our heart is pure and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments because if you read the previous verse, he talks about this is the commandment that you believe on him that God has sent and that you have, are forgiven and you have a heart that is bent on helping others. You see, God's not interested in giving us toys. Now, you can, if you want toys, go watch the TV preachers. They'll promise you anything. They'll promise you what you want because they know what you want to hear. And then, of course, they want you to send them money. The money is nothing wrong with money. It's a good tool. But there's people over there living in four and five million dollar houses riding around in chauffeur-driven Mercedes and Rolls Royces and Lincolns and Cadillacs, and they're taking money from widow women and people on, on uh, Social Security and fixed incomes, and they're over there living like kings. And that's not right. Some years ago, 
we started Godtel, and we it didn't take us very long to figure out that the big building we bought in Nacogdoches was an old hotel, that there was no way we could afford to air condition the building. Got fans, you know, and we've carried this out. We built these buildings. We didn't air condition these buildings. Our new buildings not being air conditioned. And so we lived in that building in an apartment, and we didn't have air conditioning either. And then people asked me, they said, well, Brother June, how come you don't have your house air conditioned? I said, because the people we minister to don't have air conditioning, so why should I? I have to put myself in the same livelihood framework, basically, that everybody else is in. So we don't have air conditioning in our house. There's some in the cars because they come with it, you know. But a lot of times when they break, we don't bother fixing them. For years, we drove an old van, and when the air conditioner quit working, I took it out and threw it on the ground. Just, I remember one year we were on a concert tour, and we had to go through the Mojave Desert in the daytime. And my wife, she had one of these spray bottles and a washcloth. And she had the window down, and she'd get that washcloth wet and put it there in the window so that it would feel cool on her face, you know. Because Brother June, I said, we don't really care. We've got to learn if we're going to minister to people. We can't be up here and you down here. Oh, we have some things you don't have. That's quite obvious because that's our home. You know, that's where we live. And, of course, after 40 years, you accumulate junk, whether you want it or not. Martin's got stuff in his house. He probably doesn't even know what's in there. I got stuff in my house. I ain't got a clue where it is, what it is. If somebody asked me for it, I'd say, what? The stuff, you know? I've heard preachers on TV say things like this. If you want a yacht, then imagine a yacht in your driveway and tell God Folks, let me tell you something about God. You can't tell him anything. He's God. But I've heard preachers say that. Tell God what you want, and he'll have to give it to you. God doesn't have to give you anything. Giving you salvation is more than we deserve. Well, I was thinking about that one day, watching that preacher, talking about imagining this yacht in the driveway and everything. And I said, you know... If you're going to imagine this yacht in your driveway, you probably ought to imagine a trailer with it because otherwise it'll be stuck in the asphalt. <laughs> and it won't be going anywhere. It's stupid. But they do it all the time. They're always telling you, well, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be sick. You should be well. That's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible says that God makes some people sick. Look at Job. Who did that to Job? Well, the Bible's very plain. God did. Well, the devil was back there in the background, but Job didn't acknowledge him. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He told his wife, he said, she said, why don't you curse God and die? And he says, you talk like a fool. He said, we received good things at the hand of the Lord. Shouldn't we also receive evil from God? He never once acknowledged the devil because all the devil, devil is is a second-rate messenger boy. He was doing what God, if you read the story, God told him to do. Sometimes we have agony and pain and hardship and heartache. And sometimes we're not willing to really seek God to find out what's going on. But sometimes God's there because he's testing us and he's trying to mature us and grow us and conform us to the image of Christ. And sometimes the only way he can get our attention and get it done is by bringing pain into our lives because we are hard-headed. So next time you have a pain, first thing you better do is say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Start there. You'll be closer to the truth. You can ask anything that's in God's will. That's why Jesus, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we're going to cover in a couple of weeks, he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, thy will be done. And that was the example for us. I had a guy come up to me last night and he says, Brother June, 
how do you pray? And I looked at him and I said, just talk to God. He says, you mean talk to him like anybody else? I said, sure. He knows all the words. Talk to him. He said, well, you know, I said, but you know what? You need to have an attitude whereby you are willing to listen. And you won't have an attitude of willing to listen unless you're willing to say, okay, Lord, whatever you say is what we'll do. Most people are too busy telling God what they want. God is not interested in your wants. He is interested in your needs. And some of the things that we need are hard because he's trying to perfect us, the Christians. Now, the lost people don't have to worry about this. They can do anything they want until they die and go to hell. But the Christians, whole different ball game. We're God's children, and God's going to bring into our life what we need to mature us and grow us up and to make us like Jesus. And boy, I want you to know there's a lot of dying to self, and it hurts. The only reason I've been able to stay at God till for 38 years is because I know that truth. Otherwise, I'd have bailed a long time ago because I know I can make more money than this. I can make more money at McDonald's than I make here. Of course, I'd be running the place. Wouldn't take long. Nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, but if you can work your way up and run the place, do that. <laughs> you ask anything in my name, he tells us we know that we have the petition in 1 John. That means we know God's listening to us. That doesn't mean God's going to give us what we want. We just know that God has heard what we said. And then we trust him to do right by us. And you know, he always does. He always does. Sometimes God tells us no when we ask for certain things. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says wait a while, and that's the hard one. I don't ever, you know, I don't know that I ever ask any for any stuff when I pray. I usually pray for other people. When I pray for myself, it's about forgiveness. When I pray for myself, it's about my hard-headedness and God do something with me. And sometimes God, just kill me and get me out of here. I'd rather be with you in heaven than be here. And a guy asked me one day, he said, Brother Junior, you're always talking about going to heaven? He says, you don't really know what it's like? I said, no, I don't. I said, but I know one thing about it. He said, what's that? I said, it's perfect. I know it's perfect, and that's better than here. I love my wife, but she ain't perfect. She's not Sandra Bullock. I was just trying to get them to wake up again, dear. I mean, why would you want to, if you're a Christian, why would you want to stay here? What would be the point? I mean, I'll do my job and I'll stay here as long as God wants me to doing my job, but there's really no desire to stay here. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John that if you love the world, and that's my problem, I'm always fighting that thing about, you know, popularity and, you know, the things I used to do. And sometimes my wife comes over to where I rehearse, usually an hour before she comes over for rehearsal. And a lot of times I'll put on CDs of songs I used to sing in nightclubs, and then I'll sing along with them, you know, and, and I feel sorry for myself because I'm not there, you know, getting the applause of the people. But then I always come back to the fact that God said, if you love the world, the love of God is not in you. So here I go again, having to struggle through that. Sometimes there's not a whole lot of love of God in me. I want something else, so I have to repent and get right with God. And that's what I pray about a lot, about God fixing me up so I'll be like I'm supposed to be. Sometimes I pray that God would help me to treat my wife like I'm supposed to, because I don't always, you know. But I got her buffalo, she knows I'm the boss, so, you know, everything's okay. She does. She knows. You know, I, I wear the pants in my family. She tells me what pair to put on every morning, but, you know, <laughs> that's okay. And I pray a lot about that because I, I, I just, I don't always feel like I'm treating my wife like I'm supposed to because I have wants, you know. And after all, I'm the man. I should, she needs to submit. I'll give her one of these right to the moon. 
she used to have a skillet and I was scared of her. But as she got old, she got to where she can't lift it. <laughs> Skillet's too heavy. One day I told her I'll help her lift it, but then I was afraid to because I was afraid I'd, I'd drop it and it'd fall on my head. So if you're going to ask God, you really need to read the Bible, and most people don't do that, and find out what it is God wants you to pray about in the first place. The best prayers you will ever pray are when you see yourself in the Word of God and you see what's wrong with you. David did that all through the book of Psalms. Oh no, I, I want God to I want God to heal me so I can keep smoking. I've had people ask, hey, a guy with emphysema one day. He says, Brother Jim, will you pray for me? I've got emphysema and, I'm, and they tell me I, I'm, I'm going to die of emphysema. He was like 70 years old at the time. And he had a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. And I said, are you willing to quit smoking? He said, no. And I said, well, I'm not willing to pray for you then. I figured, what was the point? But see, he wanted his cake and eat it too. He wanted to keep smoking but have healthy lungs. <laughs> I think people do that kind of stuff all the time. I'd like to pray that God would take away the traffic laws and let me drive 100 miles an hour down the street. Because I like fast. And please, Lord, fix it so I never get in a wreck. Just fast. I don't think God's going to do that anytime soon. Pray according to God's will. You can look in the book and find out what God's will is. It's right there. Oh, you don't want to do that. It's too much work. Right? Well, I think most people think that. Because every time I talk to them, they've never read it. They don't read it. Father, we thank you for loving us tonight. We do thank you for each one in the room, and we hope they're listening with a spiritual ear. The Christians in this room have that capacity. Of course, you won't make them. And if they don't want to listen to you, even when you make them miserable, if they're your child, they still don't have to listen. But the joy and the peace and the contentment that they'll find in their heart if they do listen. Because when things go wrong, they won't look at it as things going wrong. They'll look at it for what it is, a test. And I know in my life I've failed so many tests. Sometimes you are very gracious and you test us over and over and over and over until we get it right. And we thank you for that. We pray we'd see things from your point of view, as the Bible tells us to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 tells us that we don't look at the things that are seen, we look at the things that are unseen. We see things from your point of view. And then we find out why some of the trials and tribulation have to come into our lives. And then we can be, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, 20, <laughs> thankful always for all things. And we do thank you, Father, for all things. We do pray, Father, for the spirituality of the people in this room, that those who are Christians would grow a little more. And hopefully, if there's anybody in here that's lost, that they would get miserable and want Jesus. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.